Good evening, everybody. I'm Doug Bradburn. I'm the founding director of the Fred W. Smith National Library for the study of George Washington, which is where you are. Uh, and we're really delighted to see everybody out here tonight for our free evening book talk. Uh, you know, the, the library's been extremely busy in this first year. We only opened in September, and we've got all kinds of programs going on. And uh, I'm really excited about this, this evening book talk, because we've been doing it regularly, and our, we have a good audience coming. And I'm pleased to say that uh, the book talks are now generously funded by the Ford Motor Company. And Ford has had a long time relationship with Mount Vernon, going back to Henry Ford himself, who donated a fire truck. Uh, back in, I believe, 1923. And so this is really exciting for us to have the first Ford Motor Company evening book talk tonight uh, with uh, a very special person here. The other thing I want to uh, mention before we get into the main event is that we do have these happening every month, and we're going to uh, have more and more of them, not only history books, but also books uh, like the one tonight that are more on contemporary or universal concerns relating to questions of leadership, uh, questions about a character, and so uh, this is a very exciting evening for us. But the next talk, mark your calendars, get your registrations ready, July 9th. Uh, coming up, we have uh, Professor Cynthia Kierner right here from George Mason University who's going to talk on her book, Martha Jefferson Randolph, Daughter of Monticello, Her Life and Times. And uh, Cindy, for those of you who may know, it was a one-time uh, nominee for the George Washington Book Prize as well. So she's uh, an old friend to Mount Vernon, despite writing on Jefferson in this particular case. All right. So let's get to the main show. People are still filtering in, but that won't bother us at all. We have Dr. J. Philip Jack London tonight, executive chairman and chairman of the board of Khaki International, a $3.7 billion information technology and professional services, Fortune 1000 company, employing over 16,000 employees in 120 offices worldwide. Jack is known as the founder of modern era Khaki, he joined the company in 1972. He, as his book points out, he was employee number 35. So a company that now has 16,000 employees, he's seen some change. And the great thing, of course, is he's seen a lot of that change as the head, as the chief executive officer and president of the company beginning in 1984, going through 2007. So that is the kind of uh, great leadership uh, that we're going to give you tonight, uh, a man who built that company into an extraordinary force uh, in the uh, technology world. Now, Dr. London has been the recipient of numerous awards. Just reading these, you're going to get your money's worth right now. You have the John W. Dixon Award for the Association of the United States Army, the Fleet Admiral Chester Nimitz Award for the Navy League, the Reserve Officers Association Nathan Hale Award, the Naval Officers Admiral of the Navy George Dewey Award. Now, some of these I got on Wikipedia, so I don't know if they're all true or not, but uh, it goes on and on. It's really an extraordinary uh, testimony to uh, the success and leadership of Dr. London over time. And the Marine Corps Scholarship Foundation Semper Fi Award in 2014. Since 2002, the Human Resources Leadership Awards of Greater Washington has given its annual Ethics and Business Award, named in Dr. London's honor. Dr. London was inducted into the Washington Business, uh, uh, the Naval Postgraduate School, and the Greater Washington Government Contractors Awards, all three of those halls of fame. So that's three HOFs he could put after his name. Maybe you put HOF and then put a little three up in the corner like that. That's fantastic. Dr. London's graduate of the US Naval Academy and the U.S. Naval Postgraduate School, where he earned respectively a Bachelor of Science in Naval Engineering and a Master of Science in Operations Research. He has a doctorate in Business Administration from the George Washington University, of course, which he received with distinction. Over 12 years of actor duty, Dr. London served as a Naval Aviator and Aide and Administrative Assistant to the Vice Chief of the Naval Material Command. In the Naval Reserve, he was designated Aeronautical Engineering Duty Officer so there's many stories of uh, daring do and service of Dr. London uh, in active duty. And one in particular that I like in the book is that he was 
in the Caribbean when uh, John Glenn came down and you were on the team that brought Glenn out of the water. Is that right? That's right. It, it, unbelievable, extraordinary story. So uh, among all many other things, in addition to the book uh, that we're going to hear about tonight, Dr. London is the author of Our Good Name, A Company's Fight to Defend Its Honor and Get the Truth Told about Abu Ghraib, which came out in 2008. It's a very important a story there which he may or may not talk about tonight. He currently serves on the board of directors for CAUSE, the Navy Memorial Foundation, the Naval Historical Foundation, the Friends of the National World War II Memorial. He's a member of the Sons of the American Revolution. He's a Mason. He's a member of the Massachusetts Society of the Cincinnati representing Captain Samuel, Captain Samuel Nicholson, commissioned by George Washington as the first commanding officer of the USS Constitution. We like Jack most because he's married to Dr. Jennifer Burkhart London, a, a recent glittering member of our lifeguard, a crucial uh, membership group here at Mount Vernon. And she is herself a professional consultant and psychologist specializing in the application of psychological principles to business management. All right. So in reading Jack's book recently and reflecting on his extraordinary life, I think we can say he knows a little bit about success. And as I read it, I kept occurring back to me one of the famous quotes and favorite quotes of George Washington, which some of you have heard me talk about before. But it's a quote from the great play Cato by Joseph Addison, in which uh, one of the actors in the play says, and this appears in much of Washington's correspondent, "'Tis not in mortals to command success, but we can do better, Sempronius. We can deserve it. And I think what's going to become clear is that Jack has had a lot of success, but he's deserved it. And hopefully what we'll learn tonight is how we all can deserve the kind of success uh, that we hope to get in life. So please welcome Jack London. Uh, you've heard this line before, but uh, <clears throat> my mother and dad would absolutely have loved that introduction, I've got to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, thank you. Thank you. It's a, uh, a real pleasure uh, to be here tonight. Uh, a special pleasure, I might add, to be here at the uh, George Washington Library and uh, in particular uh, here in the, uh, <clears throat> this uh, center that was uh, sponsored, I believe, by uh, David Rubenstein and uh, for his philanthropy and uh, wonderful work he's done. I just, by purest of coincidence, a couple of weeks ago, had an opportunity to visit with David over at the Carlisle Group in Washington. And, talking about some other philanthropy issues and, and uh, what a wonderful uh, citizen he is of this great country as a, a son of immigrants. But uh, it's a, a remarkable story and I, I have a feeling George Washington would be very proud of, of him as well. So um, <clears throat> I would uh, want, want to lead off by saying uh, that uh, my wife was a, uh, in fact she coached me a little bit here before I got up, was to make sure that uh, <laughs> that uh, I give her credit for helping out in, uh, in, the, uh, in the book. <laughs> See, I, I know how to take care of things. But, uh, and she is, uh, as Doug mentioned, a new uh, affiliate with the uh, lifeguards here at, uh, at Mount Vernon, and we're very proud. And I'm, I'm a, I guess I get to ride a side saddle or a, a shotgun or something along with her on that, but we're, we're delighted to be a part of it. <clears throat> so, uh, can't tell you how uh, wonderful it is to be here this evening. I uh, would also like to uh, pay uh, our respects to uh, Regent uh, Barbara Lucas and uh, a good friend of ours, uh, former Regent Ann Bookout. Um, and uh, she was very instrumental in, in uh, talking to us about uh, the early beginnings of the planning for this wonderful institution, uh, this library. And um, I can't uh, for a second uh, not mention uh, President CEO Jim Reese who was a great friend of, uh, of ours uh, in his tenure here, and uh, we hope he's uh, faring well these days. And to um, uh, President uh, Kurt uh, Vibrands, uh, and uh, of course Susan McGill, Susan's here I think, uh, somewhere I'm over there she is, and th thank you for your hospitality and all you've done, and Mr. Stephen McLeod as well, and uh, thank you Doug for your introduction. I must say, starting off, you've done a wonderful, fabulous job here uh, at the uh, Mount Vernon uh, uh, George Washington Library. So uh, it is truly, indeed, great to be here. I uh, also felt a uh, personal connection uh, to George Washington, as, as Doug mentioned uh, 
I have my, my collateral ancestor <clears throat> was the, um, I'll be a little more specific uh, about the Society of the Cincinnati Connection. Uh, this uh, collateral ancestor of mine was uh, the first commanding officer of the USS Constitution. Uh, old Ironsides, which is still on the active Navy register, register and uh, is uh, birthed these days in, in Boston, uh, the Navy Yard. Uh, he was also uh, a captain, a sea captain, um, during the uh, American Revolution and sailed in the days and around the same places that uh, John Paul Jones did. Uh, that was Samuel Nicholson. But he, uh, <clears throat> quite frankly, never got quite the uh, claim that uh, John Paul got, so perhaps he didn't deserve it either, I don't know. But in any case, uh, uh, I'm very proud to represent him uh, for his uh, great service in the American uh, Revolution. Um, so uh, I do have uh, a lot of interest in the topic of character, and tonight I'm going to uh, present some perspectives uh, with regard to George Washington's character and how it has uh, uh, really impacted and uh, created the values in many ways of our great society. Uh, I'm not here to do a book review. Um, book reviews aren't appropriate by authors anyway, <laughs> uh, as you all probably well know. But um, instead, I want to do something a little bit different. I want to uh, start with a uh, status report, a character status report. And my report will uh, say that we are headed in the wrong direction, regrettably. Uh, I'm also going to talk about how, as I mentioned, George Washington's exemplary character helped frame the values of our country and wh how they echo uh, across the uh, centuries here and uh, are indeed uh, something we should be reflecting on in a more serious way, in my opinion. So as I see it, we've had way too many examples of wrongdoing these days over the past 15 years. Examples like Enron, WorldCom, Lehman Brothers, and Bernie Madoff come to mind. Uh, the uh, fabulous uh, fraud schemes, the Ponzi schemes of Mr. Madoff, you undoubtedly are somewhat familiar. <clears throat> For several months now, we've also learned about how General Motors spent a decade hiding design problems in several of their automobiles. That contributed to at least 13 deaths, reportedly so. So how is it that uh, GM management uh, could not know about these serious difficulties over this period of time? A little difficult to uh, perceive. As a result, the United States government fined GM the maximum amount allowable at the time, a paltry $35 million for their deadly mistakes, or reportedly uh, one day's revenue from General Motors. Many would think, uh, that's a shameful situation. On the other hand, it's still not completely uh, unfolded, I think. But there's also uh, public sector difficulties as well. In the public sector, there are IS, uh, IRS scandals of various uh, perspectives. Benghazi has um, had its scandalous perspectives. Bribery and fraud in Army, United States Army procurement uh, processes and among naval officers and uh, Southeast Asia, bribery and fraud. Uh, certainly, uh, you perhaps are aware of the rampant sexual abuse issues within the military services these days, and our, our wonderful uh, chairman and uh, Joint Chiefs of Staff had to testify on Capitol Hill about a, year, about a year ago as we speak, and promised the United States Congress that they would address these issues. My point is, what a tragedy that is by itself, but the fact that they were required to call up and to be to put in a position of having to promise to fix it. Uh, there's a message there as well. Uh, the VA scandal. It, every time I pick up the paper, something's popping up that's going haywire. Uh, it's now estimated that over 1,000 veterans may have died in the last decade because of malpractice and the lack of care at the VA medical centers. Veterans' medical files, in the first part, were destroyed, and then it was found that alternate lists were also kept to eliminate backlog requests for medical exams. Now, I'm not here to judge these issues or uh, point out the perspectives of the various considerations, 
But uh, I submit to you, these are not good trends. These are issues that are of significant concern for us. And I would just say, what a tragedy. But then again, this town um, is infamous for people thinking they can somehow hide the truth and get away with it. Or in some cases, cover up problems once they arise. How many times have you seen that formula unfold uh, over the last three or four decades? Um, how many times has that shameful story been played out in our wonderful city, in our <coughs> belo beloved country? On the other hand, I'm frankly not surprised at all of this. Uh, I lament that. According to the 2013 National Business Ethics Survey, observed misconduct, observed misconduct in the American workplace is at 41%. 41%. So where do we look for help? Well, one might thank the, our government officials, but apparently not from today's uh, political and uh, government leaders. According to recent polls, 65% of Americans are dissatisfied with how our government works. Two out of three. Congress's approval rating is a mere 13%. And the President of the United States fares a little better at about 41 or 42 percent. These are all recent statistics. And they're not something I calculated. They're something I pulled out of the data files, public files. The lack of confidence is also affecting us globally. According to the Reputation Institute, the United States ranked 22nd, yes, 22nd, among the world's most reputable countries. Canada, Sweden, Switzerland, and Australia were at the top. And I didn't look any further. Our ranking is much higher on the World Economic Forums out of Switzerland on their competitive index for 2013-2014. Here, the United States ranks fifth. Better, but somehow I'd like to think we were number one. <laughs> Not so encouraging, not so encouraging, is that out of 148 countries polled in this survey, this well-established economic survey organization headquartered in uh, Switzerland, the United States ranks 50th for public trust in our politicians, number 48th for transparency of government policy, and t uh, 32nd for ethical behavior of our firms corporations. So this certainly isn't the number one that I used to know and think and love in my youth and in my early days. Um, and what I suspect you have always believed and thought about for yourself and your organizations and your country. So I <clears throat> am concluding uh, from uh, this research. Uh, there are too many people choosing not to do the right thing. Even worse, it would seem, by these reports anyway, that uh, too many of us can't be trusted to do the right thing. In the three and a half years uh, it took to write and publish my book, uh, that was uh, mostly nights and weekends, it became clear, at least in my view, that many of the problems we have in our country today are due to a weakness in character. And we're going to talk about that, of course for both individuals and for organizations. And there is such a thing as an organizational character. In 1929, the journalist H.L. Uh, Mencken said profoundly, as I see it, there is something even more valuable to civilization than wisdom, and that is character. That, by the way, is one of the main leading quotations in my book. I believe Mencken essentially got it right. Turns out, character is what matters with all people, at all times, and everywhere on this planet. In my book, I define character as a unique set of moral and ethical qualities that define what you believe in, your values, what you stand for, and what you expect of yourself and others. 
It embraces, of course, <coughs> integrity, values, and doing the right thing. While a variety of factors form our capabilities and influence the events in our lives, I believe that how you act on these qualities, your statement of character, determines how far you will go. And that, of course, is the thesis uh, in this book. This personal belief, a personal belief, reflecting on a lifetime of various experiences, it became the basis of uh, my book, this personal belief. Character is the fundamental, the fundamental human value that creates success, the ultimate success factor. And what do I mean by that? I'll tell you in a moment. And if you stop to think that national character is built on the characters, the character and value of collectively its citizens, it's a statement we now seem to all need to be working on. So what can we do? What can we do? Luckily, there are many great examples from our history and our culture that inspire good character, thankfully. Lots of wonderful role models. One of my favorite is uh, Dr. Jonas Salk. Why Jonas Salk? I was uh, a youngster in the uh, war days, World War II days, and the polio epidemic in our country was a terrifying thing for us. I know my mother and dad wouldn't let us go to the swimming pool, the public swimming pool, because of fear of contracting polio. Well, it was uh, Jonas Salt that uh, discovered the penicillin, uh, the uh, vaccine cure for polio. <clears throat> but what, what made that uh, such a character perspective? Because he refused to take a prohibitive pattern, uh, patent on it and restrict its trade, he made it available to the world and thereby, obviously, uh, for, for what, uh, a great fortune. And uh, to me, that's, that's, that's a pretty big deal. He gave that uh, vac vaccine uh, uh, to the world. And then there's Jane Goodall and Albert Einstein, Ulysses Grant, Harry Truman, Ben Franklin, to name a few. And by the way, I have vignettes and uh, little stories about each of these uh, in my book that I think you'll find uh, perhaps novel and in some, some ways even, as some people have said, entertaining. It's very important to have a uh, little entertainment in such a subject as this I had discovered as I was reviewing it. But uh, there are a few people who exemplify character like George Washington. And uh, I must say I have for decades and decades of my life. Been impressed by the life of Washington, his sacrifice on a personal level and his leadership on a different level. And of course that's why <clears throat> Mount Vernon, the Mount Vernon Ladies Association teaches George Washington's life and legacy of character to their credit, to inspire future generations. And we sorely need that, in my opinion. As I mentioned, uh, he's always been one of my personal role models. And I talk about that in, in my book. And I'm going to talk about it now. Because the qualities of his character are timeless. They're not situational. They're not epical. They are timeless, in my view. Now I want to put another perspective here for a second. Let me be clear that having good character does not mean, uh, mean being perfect or self-righteous or holier than thou or however you might want to characterize it. As far as I'm concerned, a person, a person's and an organization's character is always a work in progress. There's always room for improvement. There are always things you can learn. Something new to learn for all of us. And that's no matter where you are or where we are in our lives or in our careers. This specifically includes you <laughs> as well as me. There's always something we can do to enhance and, and develop. That's my belief. So Washington, like anyone else, was not perfect. 
But he truly understood, as I interpret his life and have read about his life, the importance of character and why it was the basis of his and our nation's success. As a consequence, I believe there are three key lessons from Washington's character that should inspire a character turnaround in our country. And I'll get to that little thought here later, too. The first lesson is that you alone, you alone are responsible for who you are, for your character and your success or failure in life. I had the good fortune of learning this lesson early on uh, at the foot of my father, who was a loving father, not much of a disciplinarian, but I think a great teacher. And he often, <clears throat> he was raised at the turn of the last century <clears throat> in high school. And one of the things that uh, they did in the, the log cabin schools in Oklahoma, central Oklahoma, at the turn of the century, before it was state, they taught the uh, youngsters to recite poems. And my father had about six or seven of them, and I must have heard them several hundred times <laughs> growing up. His favorite, <clears throat> one of his favorites, was Invictus by William Henley, published in 1875. Mr. Henley wrote about facing life's challenges with fortitude and conviction. The last lines of his poem, and it's a beautiful poem, have always stayed with me at my father's side. These read, <clears throat> It matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishments the scroll. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. If you look on the back of my book, there are inscriptions and endorsements from two very important people down at the bottom. One is Commander Everett Alvarez, United States Navy. The other is Colonel Lee Ellis, United States Air Force. Now, what's so special about that? I'll tell you what's special, very special. Everett Alvarez was the first naval aviator to be shot down in, Van uh, in uh, Vietnam and incarcerated in the infamous Hanoi Hilton. Eight and a half years. Lee Ellis, similar uh, situation for Air Force, five and a half years. You'll have to give me that these folks know a little bit about what character is all about. The fact that they were able to endure and prevail <clears throat> in horrendous circumstances. And if you've read a few uh, articles or books uh, by <coughs> Jim Stockdale or others uh, uh, of that era, uh, you will reflect quickly on what, I'm, what I've just said. Although rather little is known about Washington's youth, but I have a feeling the research in this institution will flesh that out in due course as well. <laughs> Washington, though, <clears throat> seems to have also learned this lesson about being the captain of his soul early in life as a young man. As evidence, uh, I would at least submit to this group that we have Washington's rules of civility and decent behavior in company and conversation. That's a rather formidable title, isn't it? Which he transcribed at age 16. I can't remember when I was 16. <laughs> For example, rule number 44. It reads, when a man does all he can, though it succeeds not well, blame not him that did it when a man does all he can, is the operative issue there. I submit to you these are rather mature insights, certainly for a 16-year-old. They came from a boy whose father's death, when he was 11, prevented him from obtaining the education in England that his brothers had received. And it is reported that Washington's mother had objected to his appointment in the Royal Navy at age 15. And as a former naval officer, I 
commend to her for her wisdom. Uh, but that's a different side, isn't it? Washington later secured a job as a surveyor of Culpeper County at age 17, my research tells me. When Washington's older brother died, he became head of the family at age 20. He soon followed in his late brother's steps to become a district adjutant. That was a step that put him on the path to a military career. As young Washington could have easily sulked about missed opportunities and entitlements, I like to think that he chose to make the best of his situation and prove himself with every new challenge. At least that's my belief. Unfortunately though, today, too many people we see around us in our culture and society don't agree with or want to accept this level of responsibility, this personal accountability. And that's part of what we need to address. Just to give you a comparative example, let's talk about one of the leaders uh, and representative of the greatest generation, meaning the World War II uh, people. So one person who did accept responsibility was General Dwight David Eisenhower. As he prepared for D-Day, the D-Day invasion, invasion of 1944, and despite massive preparations for the largest over the sea invasion ever, and probably never will be another one of that scale and scope. And just as anecdotes, my wife's uncle was a D-Day June 6 man that went across Utah Beach. My uncle, uh, a second lieutenant was uh, across uh, Omaha Beach a little bit later. Her uncle was uh, successful and lived through the war. The Battle of Ardennes was hurt uh, terribly. My uncle didn't make it back. He lost his life in the fighting the Waffen SS in St. Lo, the Battle for St. Lo. So, Eisenhower did have a sense of accountability and responsibility for the magnitude of what he was asking people to do. So on June 5, <clears throat> he made two bold decisions. The first was to proceed with the attack <clears throat> and the landing. Truly a major decision. The second was a private note he wrote and penned to the Army Chief of Staff, General George Marshall. <clears throat> wherein Eisenhower took responsibility for the decision to make the attack, to launch the attack. Responsibility, accountability. He wrote, and you can look it up uh, on the internet if you like, that his decision was based on the best information available, but, quote, if any blame or fault attaches to the attempt, it is mine alone. Of course, that note was never sent, but its message has been heard ever since. Ownership over our decisions, <clears throat> our actions and consequences, good or bad, is perhaps the ultimate measure of character. The ultimate measure of character is that notion of accountability. Lots of people can say they have responsibility, but when things don't go quite right, uh, they find ways to point to other people. And it's that accountability, that full, committed accountability, that I think is so representative of really good character, quality character. The next lesson we can take from George Washington is that character sets a precedent, indeed. In fact, his 48th rule of civility, I'm going back there, was when you reprove another, be unblameable yourself. For example, is more prevalent than precepts. In other words, uh, uh, be careful uh, criticizing others until you can uh, stand up on your own and uh, point to some achievements. Uh, a lot of wisdom in there, especially if these were transcribed by a 16-year-old. In the examples I gave earlier, 
there were people who operated in an environment where doing the wrong thing was somehow worth the risk they thought or even condoned in some cases. The precedents and results were disastrous and tragically so. So the precedent of doing the right thing has to be embodied in our culture. Culture that embraces, again, what we believe is the right way to conduct our affairs and how to treat one another. Successful organizations, either the ones we work for or belong to, or subscribe to in some cases, make culture an ongoing priority. I'm confident of this. They will, for example, have foundation documents that state organizational missions, values, and guiding principles. These principles will be reinforced by codes of conduct and ethics, which must be reviewed regularly, of course. And repetition here is essential. And most importantly, they must be set as the highest priority and fully supported by the top leadership, the top management. That is the key element that must be part of organizational character. The other necessity is ethical leadership. The function of leadership is the demonstration and communication of character. Leaders are responsible for maximizing their organization's abilities and recognizing their achievements and performing and accomplishing things. But they're also role models, whether they like it or not. We people take our cues from our leaders on how to treat each other and how to address challenges. That's what happens. More importantly, perhaps, <clears throat> leaders show us what not to do, such as tolerate wrongdoing or make excuses for our failings. As leader of the Continental Army, General Washington is perhaps best known for crossing the Delaware. And there may be some other views of that Yorktown left, but for the purpose of description here, we'll, we'll say uh, the Delaware. Uh, but he was also praised for how he co uh, coordinated with state officials and Congress to obtain the supplies the necessary uh, for his field, uh, for the troops in his field how he worked with uh, other generals and other officials and promoted cohesion and morale among the soldiers. But at the war's ending in March of 1783, a group of frustrated Continental Army officers wanted to discuss pay grievances. There were rumors about the young country's, the young country's uh, solvency and they wanted to consider a possible insurrection against Congress. Washington suggested the next officers meeting as the venue for discussion. Washington unexpectedly and unwelcomed, I, I read, attended the meeting. There he identified with the officers concerns, reasonably to do so, but argued that the character of the military and America would not allow them to, quote, overturn the liberties of our country and open the floodgates of civil discord and deluge our rising empire in blood, end of quote. So the sincerity and eloquence of Washington's plea were not very well received, we read. Washington then took out a letter from a member of Congress to explain the government's financial difficulties. But the small print was quite difficult to read. Washington abruptly stopped and took out a pair of reading glasses from his coat pocket to the officer's great surprise. He then said, gentlemen, will you permit me to put on my spectacles? For I have not only grown gray, but almost blind in the service of my country." Unquote. So Washington finished reading the letter and then left without saying a word. 
The officers were deeply moved by their leader's vulnerability. Washington's empathetic gesture reassured the officers, reassured them, and they unanimously voted to preserve the rule of Congress, the rule of law, and the course of this country. An example and demonstration of character up close and personal. Later, President Washington focus continued on unifying the nation and establishing a national government, as we all know. He had already realized that everything he did at that point set a precedent. It was one precedent after another. Already financially secure by all comparable uh, notions, he decided that he should decline the sizable salary that was being offered to him. Declined it. But soon realized that that was a mistake. Because by doing so, it might seem to put the office of the president beyond the reach of anybody but the most wealthy of individuals. Not a good precedent. He notably rebuked efforts for his role to have a majestic title or take on the mantle of kingship or exalted prince or ruler or some such before finally settling on Mr. President, the term we use to this very day. Other notable presidents, uh, precedents uh, I could include here would be refusing to run for a third term, appointing a cabinet and, of course, delivering an inaugural address. But those are more ministerial issues. But there were precedents, and he realized that he was setting precedents. Perhaps the uh, most revealing story of Washington's character comes from his adversary. When King George III reportedly asked his American painter, Mr. Benjamin West, what Washington would do after winning independence, gaining the independence of this great country. West pondered it, thought a little bit, and replied, they say he will return home. This place over here. The king replied, quote, if he does that, he will be the greatest man in the world, unquote. My presumption is that's an accurate uh, statement, uh, not apocryphal, but I did find it and it seemed most appropriate and sounded like it characterized what George Washington actually did. By setting the example of doing the right thing, George Washington's character set a precedent at home and abroad. And I believe it's an example, frankly, that should be followed and adhered to today. The final lesson, uh, and perhaps most important lesson, we can take from Washington is that character is the key to success. That's my perspective as well. But I found him talking about it. His 110th rule <laughs> read, labor to keep alive in your breast that little spark of celestial fire called conscience. Labor to keep alive in your breast that little spark of celestial fire called conscience. So you can see how my book reflects the views of Washington in so many ways. In my book, I define success uniquely as acting with honesty and integrity, performing to the best of your ability, and appreciating all the people along the way who have helped you achieve your goals. This definition is at least to some extent unique, at least in my view, because I don't see success measured by, by what many uh, attribute to the term success. For example, wealth power, rank, political position, fame in some other way. But I think more importantly, it's how you go about it. And success isn't achieved in one milestone, in my view, but rather over a lifetime of experiences. The same is true for our nation's longevity. Scandals, such as the ones I mentioned earlier, have in many ways undermined our confidence in our country. 
According to the Edelman Trust Barometer, only France and Hong Kong have a larger decline in trust in the government than the United States over the past year. That's a reasonably a competent organization, and those findings, if indeed representative of the truth, are quite frightening. Today, less than 20% of Americans believe leaders and government officials will tell the truth when confronted with a difficult issue. 20%. That means the distrust factor is 80%. Washington understood the importance of fortitude, as well as accountability and leadership. The winter of 1777 and 1778 at Valley Forge was hard for Washington's army. A great tragedy that we all have heard about or studied. Lacking adequate food, clothing, and shelter, many men deserted the army. Over 2,500 died from harsh conditions, including my ancestor, John Burnett, of the 10th Virginia Regiment of Foot. That's another term for infantry. <laughs> and he was from Amherst County. He perished uh, in the spring of 1778. Denying Washington's request for money to supply his troops, Congress instructed him to resort to an old military practice, foraging. And one of the Redcoats, uh, and, and one that the Redcoats were doing at the time, taking what they needed from the citizenry and the people in the countryside. But Washington held firm and refused to use force to get the supplies and would punish any soldier caught stealing or breaking the law in that regard. Why? It's because Washington knew this would undermine public support for the fledgling cause. Right off the bat. They're doing just what the other guys do. Pillaging. But Washington also, Washington also wanted his army to set an example about the rule of law for this new country. And he was right. Washington understood the need to establish public confidence in the new government and to demonstrate that political leaders could act virtuously. He believed, there's evidence, he believed his character was much more important to the success of the, of the republic, the, the young new republic, than were his policies. He wrote to Alexander Hamilton that he hoped to always possess firmness and virtue enough to maintain what I consider the most enviable of all titles, the character of an honest man. That's George Washington speaking. But Washington also knew that his character alone wouldn't determine the fate of the young nation. In time, he would be gone. That responsibility belonged to the people of the United States of America, and it still belongs to us today. And that's a big piece of the message that I have for you. Washington determined that it is their choice, our choice, our choice, and it depends on their conduct, our conduct, whether we will represent and be respectable and prosperous. Or, as he would say, contemptible and miserable as a nation. If you get it right, you get it right, and if you don't, you don't. <laughs> he knew that with the eyes of the whole world turned upon them, our new young republic, this was the moment to establish or ruin their national character forever. You get one chance to do it right. You get one chance to make a first good impression. These words were written on June 8, 1783, 231 years ago, and are just as true, in my opinion, as they were then. And our choice, our choice, our country must continue making. So it's uh, for our nation's success that I'm uh, calling for a, uh, a call to action. I like to think um, we need a turnaround, a character turnaround, for the success of our country. Ms. Eleanor Roosevelt once said, I think it's a terrific quotation, people grow through experience if they meet life honestly and courageously. This is how character is built. 
National character is built on the character and values of our people. Through personal accountability, setting good examples, reinforcing trust, trust in organizations and ethical leadership. We can continue to have headlines, as I indicated earlier, about fraud, cheating, bribery, duplicity, and do nothing about it. Or we can do the right thing, or attempt to do the right thing, and see that it gets done, starting with us. I think it's all about character, values, and pride. Character, values, and pride. So this is what my book is about. Character, the ultimate success factor. I uh, wrote this book uh, to have value and meaning for every one of us. And as Norm Augustine, uh, the former CEO and uh, chairman of Lockheed Martin, wrote in the foreword to my book, and I was very proud to have him do so, he said, character is something we should all think about no matter where we are in life. And I tried to convey that notion to you. And I'm even going to say it again. Character is something we all should be thinking about, no matter where we are in life. So if we want to see things take a better course, we jolly well better commit to character and spread the word and do something about it. And then I also want to thank, again, my Naval Academy friend, Roger Stallback, um, and my two former POW friends. And I have many POW friends, but these two helped me. Um, Ev Alvarez, uh, Alvarez and uh, Lee Ellis for their words. Uh, again, they are most qualified to have represented their thoughts here. Lastly, I want you to know that all the royalties associated with uh, this book, which I paid for, um, all the royalties that come in on the proceeds from the sales are going, every single penny, are going to cause which stands for Comfort for America's Uniformed Services, which helps wounded warriors and veterans from the Iraq War and the Afghanistan Wars and their families through rehabilitation and recreational support programs. I'm also proud to be a charter member of CAUSE's Board of Directors since it was founded right after the war started in Iraq in 2003. I believe in what they do. It's a wonderful service. And I thank you for your donations and support in this regard, on their behalf. My company has been supporting CAUSE for the past 12 years as well, at a rather modest level, but uh, very faithful. As CECI's motto states, if you've picked that up somewhere, <laughs> we are ever vigilant as a company and in our community. And we would thank you for your generous donations to cause. So um, that's about it. I want to thank everyone again uh, who made this evening possible and to all of you for attending and being here tonight. I think the, the concepts uh, relating to character are so forefront in our society today that they bear perhaps even more, uh, a more, more extraordinary uh, set of uh, emphasis, uh, level of emphasis and consideration. And I encourage you to think in those terms and communicate those ideas as you say things happening around you. Because I guarantee you that one thing that I know from my own organizational experience, there won't be any change unless we make it happen. That's, that's, I can guarantee that for you. So, thank you. That's, uh, that's where we are. Thank you very much. Yeah. When I applied for the job in Mount Vernon, it was the first job application or the job description that I ever applied for in which they asked for someone of great integrity to apply. And that told me a lot about the organization and something I really realized coming here is this really attempt to live the life of Washington's legacy there. Uh, and one of the great things we're doing in this library is building leadership programs with one of the fundamental pillars being around character, the development of character. 
Uh, and we believe, I think, with you, Jack, that this is time the country and, and the world, uh, there's so many examples of failures of care uh, and ongoing failures that we really do feel the necessity <coughs> to you know, emphasize uh, and push people to achieve uh, and live up to a certain standard. I mean, what's so striking today is that there's so much emphasis on fame without shame. I mean, reality TV shows and the whole celebration of just being famous for anything, for things that, you know, would, would you, I mean, they would make Caligula blush, right? I mean, unbelievable. So I want to ask you then, you know, as you kick off uh, this conversation, actually, when, I want to get at sort of why you decided now was the time to write this book. When, who came to you and said, Jack, you've got to write this book. What, what was the origins of this particular book, and how did it begin? I thank you for that, Jack. Um, sorry, follow, follow. Uh, yes. This is better, huh? Yeah, okay. <laughs> Started a, a number of years ago, and um, I started off to uh, write a, um, a fairly concise booklet, pamphlet, if you will, a fairly uh, maybe 30 or 40 pages, 50 pages, for my, uh, my employees. Uh, because of the importance of uh, uh, integrity, uh, we uh, are custodians of uh, significant amounts of the uh, taxpayer's money. Uh, we are expected to uh, do our very best and perform uh, in uh, significant ways to achieve remarkable results for our clients and customers, and most, uh, uh, most of which uh, are in the national security arena. We do a, a heavy amount of communications work, intelligence uh, systems and support, as well as other agencies, and there is a, a, a real responsibility we have uh, for the stewardship of those monies. And I wanted to make sure that my organization felt that obligation like I did. That this is important stuff, and uh, we encourage people to do their very best. And it's not a, not only a document of admonition or, or putting people down, but to elicit their, their best, uh, uh, the best that's in them. So I started off in that direction, and the more I got into it, I started looking at anecdotes and quotes and looking back over the last decade or two, and I said, my land. There's, an, there's something happening out here, and I'm very uncomfortable with it. And uh, I, I thought, well, the, uh, there's, there's maybe some uh, material here for a, uh, for a document or a book that uh, should, could share some of these perspectives and do it in a way that was uh, uh, not um, um, pedagogical or academic or tutorial. Uh, that was more a, uh, a user-friendly type of document they could read and maybe even have a few a few humorous perspective uh, anecdotes from time to time throughout the book and I had a great time looking uh, up uh, quotations and anecdotes and uh, so that's how it started was really uh, uh, for our uh, uh, and, and by the way we've been um, uh, going around to our employees and our, our wonderful CACI people and providing them copies and I give a little talk not quite this long but <laughs> I do it a brown bag lunch uh, type of thing and uh, share with them uh, the importance of uh, of what we're trying to talk about here. I, I would tell you one thing. You find that uh, the notion of uh, doing the right thing, character, integrity, people that believe in that perspective and way of life tend to attract others. And those that are not comfortable or, or uh, kind of like to cut the corners and do things that are not quite on the square, they're not too happy or comfortable and they tend to drift away. So there is a certain degree of uh, self-sustaining uh, aspects of this uh, and of course in industry we have the opportunity uh, to uh, recruit people and, and it's a little bit different from certain government organizations or military for example but um, uh, I think that um, th the main thing was to create a document and I started down that trail for the purposes I've indicated but I found that there was enough I believe I, I thought to really uh, to tell a, a more broad gauge story and maybe have a little bit better, uh, more impact so that's sort of the the gen genesis of it, if you will. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much. All right, well, let's open this up. Before we do, one final note. I, I want to welcome tonight uh, Mr. Ted Eagles uh, and his class from St. Albans School who is here, here. Uh, for this special presentation. So, here, here. Uh, let's, 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 let
who's first? Yes, yeah, right there. Yes, sir. Uh, Dr. Lender. Uh, I'm curious, I think, why do you think that the uh, moral uh, movements in our country have been declining uh, in the recent days? When do you think this uh, happened? I think it's a trend lined over. Uh, several decades, a number of decades. Um, I'm not a scholar in this area. I have researched it and I've studied it in, in many ways and thought about it. Uh, but it's just a matter of the uh, frequency with which we see these things happening. And uh, I will tell you now, I, I'm so tuned into this stuff that every time I pick up a newspaper and I have five or six of them delivered every day, or uh, check into a news show of some sort, or check a banner on the uh, on my uh, uh, computer, I find that there's something going wrong somewhere. And sometimes it's a pretty big scale. I would submit to you just as one isolated example, but a big one. This whole issue of the uh, epidemic uh, sexual abuse in the military services is something in my day, and, and Mickey, my, my classmate, uh, Mickey Garvert here, Captain Garvert, uh, which has not, not been an equation. I mean, uh, th this is a new phenomenon. Uh, perhaps it's because of the gender issue. I'm not sure I wouldn't uh, want to uh, opine on that. But I know that that is a big deal now and a real problem. And it's uh, not abating. And the uh, chairman, uh, the Joint Chiefs, and the uh, uh, Chief of Staff, the CNO, the Army and Air Force, and so on, have had to uh, address this full on. In fact, one of the things I did uh, this last uh, spring, a few months ago, was I gave a, uh, a presentation over at the Department of Defense and the, uh, uh, the Secretary's, uh, Secretary of Defense's organization in the Readiness Group. And uh, attending that day was uh, Rear Admiral Meg uh, Klein, who has been designated by Secretary Hagel to take on the job of looking how uh, uh, improvements can be made in this performance area associated with integrity, sexual abuse, and so on. And um, so I know it's red hot over there. And I did get a letter from, uh, from uh, Secretary Hagel thanking me for, uh, for coming and uh, presenting uh, that day. And uh, so it's not, it's, not, it's not one of these little things. It's a big deal. And uh, there's been a trend line of these things, in my opinion, that have been happening more and more, more frequently over the uh, last uh, several decades. Certainly uh, the, uh, all the Enron stuff and WorldCom and Bernie Ebers and all of that from the last decade, uh, Madoff, I mean, it, it can't get much worse than that in terms of the financial fraud side of it. So it's a trend line that, uh, uh, that I have uh, believed is headed in the wrong direction. And I would like to see emphasis uh, placed on these issues. Uh, I hope that shares with you perspective. Yes, ma'am. Yes, I have a question. Where do you think this should begin? Personally, I'm in your age zone, and I would say something has happened in our schools and education system that is fostering this lack of integrity and character, whether it's in homework, uh, kids today, they don't even listen in class, they're texting back and forth, they're driving, texting, um, that, in that, and it goes into an adulthood where in this area, for example, there are 200 homeowners civic associations. And yet, when you have an area-wide meeting in any category or committee, you're lucky to find six people to devote their time to operating our local governors, etc. It's as though when you try to get somebody to volunteer, why should I waste my time? They're going to do what they want to do anyway. This attitude is so pervasive that I am like you. I'm very worried about the future of this country. I'm concerned as well about the uh, about um, uh, the teaching of uh, civics and our government structure. Uh, in the uh, did I turn this off or something? 
Um, yes, I did. <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> tech guy here. I'm a tech guy. <laughs> uh, I am concerned at that level as well. Um, I have not researched it, uh, and I'm not uh, qualified to opine on the uh, uh, what might be the um, uh, trend lines, and I'm sure that uh, that work uh, would be important, and maybe there has been some studies in it. I, I was <clears throat> trying to draw um, more a, a, a picture of what's, what's the situation today, rather than its um, evolution and how it came about and what's maybe the causes of it. Uh, perhaps I should do that, but couldn't get around everything. I, I wanted to characterize what I saw as the situation today, and then what I thought could be some some things that could be uh, put in place to uh, help get the turnaround going. And I think it has to start with people of maturity, frankly, uh, and then communicate that to all of our citizenry. Right here. That's an excellent question. I've been asked that several times, and uh, I've pondered uh, what uh, might uh, be an appropriate reflection. Um, I am not comfortable about the trend line. Uh, much of my professional career, business and technology side, has been spent trying to look into the looking glass, into the crystal ball, and determine what the trends are, trend lines, including uh, the geopolitical situation. I don't see anything right now that tells me we're in the midst of some kind of turnaround. I see continuation of issues. However, there's one thing that I do want to say here that I will quickly add that there are millions and millions of wonderful people in this country that share these values and ethical perspectives that, that we share. And it's up to that group, our group, if you will, that are committed to making this thing, uh, to, to adjusting it and getting back in the right direction. So I'm, I have wonderful confidence, in fact, total confidence, that we have the resiliency to do so. But there has to be some catalyst, something that gets that going. Some people have told me, well, we need a national leader. We need a, an old-fashioned hero of some sort that uh, can set the standard and uh, lead, the, lead the cause. And perhaps that is, uh, uh, would be a great uh, thing to have. But um, <clears throat> right now, I'm worried about the trend line. Jennifer wants to say something here, Douglas. Uh. I wanted to try to, I have a PhD in psychology, so I thought maybe I'd give a little input on the tolerance of what's going on. Um, you know, these kind of scandals used to be shocking, and people would uh, be up in arms about it, but what happens when we're exposed to certain things over time, we become desensitized to it, and I think, you know, anymore, we look at these as like, oh, this is the latest scandal, and it can be two or three a day, and our perspective has changed. It's almost expected now, as opposed to uh, evoking the shock that it would have. I think someone asked about the historical uh, perspective on this, and um, so I think the threshold, our threshold has gone up in tolerating this, and um, we're not standing back and saying, wait a minute, you know, this tide has gotten so so great, we need to push it back. And so I think what Jack is trying to convey in his book is that, um, you know, we all look at ourselves and our friends, our neighbors, our leaders, and, and start saying or even demanding that we uh, demonstrate um, better character and uh, develop a, a, a different threshold in what we will accept. So I, I hope that helps on the the you know perspective of how we got to where we are and maybe what we can do you know going forward there was a book written many many years ago and I have a copy of it uh, by a pre written by a president and uh, back in the uh, in the late 50s and uh, my mother was a political um, operative in the state of Oklahoma and uh, this was in 1960 and there was a certain gentleman elected uh, the president and upon his inauguration in, uh, in uh, 1961, my mother sent him a copy of a book and asked him uh, in writing, and I have the correspondence, 
that uh, her son had just become a uh, uh, commissioned uh, naval officer, was a, at that time a, a Lieutenant JG. And would he, would she please, uh, would he please sign a book to uh, her son? And um, so um, in the summer of uh, 1961, I received in a brown package wrapped with twine, kind of skinned up a little bit, from my mom. And um, I opened it up, and it was a book entitled Profiles and Courage. Profiles and Courage. Uh, signed to Lieutenant J.G., J. Philip London. Best wishes, John Fitzgerald Kennedy. I still have that book. <laughs> I've carried that book all over the planet. Uh, its uh, dust cover is torn, and I carried it in my duffel bag and on my back, but I never left it anywhere. I still have it in my safe. Why do I mention it? Profiles and courage were about politicians over the last um, hundred and some odd years who had taken stands on unpopular uh, matters and circumstances and paid severely at the personal level for the commitment for doing what was per what they perceived as the, was the right thing to do. And I think history showed that they had done the right thing, but they paid an awful price for it. And one of the things that I learned <clears throat> from that book is um, um, standing up and being accountable and doing what you think is right doesn't always lead to a personal uh, satisfaction but you are a success. You are a success. Because you've given it your best, you've given your best shot, and you can always look in that mirror and never have to turn your head or blink. And to many of us, that is really the test, the, really the test of who am I? And can I reasonably be proud of what I do? Not perfect. I made a lot of mistakes. But I hope I will never make one associated with character and integrity. Uh, there's another thing I learned, <clears throat> I picked up a number of years ago, and it's a little more uh, subtle, uh, but it's a psychological kind of thing, that uh, faced with the enormous challenges uh, in uh, life-threatening situations, combat situations, or high-stress political situations, or even sometimes business situations, um, I noted that um, Individuals sometimes develop the capacity to step, step outside of themselves and be able to address a problem without concern for their own safety or consequence. And if you read the stories of some of the uh, v uh, Vietnam prisoners or some of the uh, combat situations in the Second World War, you will you'll pick up that flavor that individuals were able to take on the issue and challenge and set aside personal consequence. Boy, that was an epiphany when I realized that that's how people have and can behave and how powerful that is. <laughs> you stop and think how powerful that is as a, uh, as a mode of operation. So there's a couple of uh, little additional things that I share with you. I think the, uh, the story of the... Uh, the uh, Kennedy book is in, in my book. But this could go on and on. Let's do one more because we're running late on time. Ted, do you have a question you want to you want to do? Are your students? Go ahead, right here. Uh, what role do you see the media playing in eroding American trust in our public figures? <laughs> wow. <laughs> um, the uh, media is so ubiquitous in so many different uh, forms and fashions today. Uh, you talk about the um, social networks, uh, the uh, cable TV, uh, what you see on your computer, the banner stuff, and the uh, news pop-ups. Uh, uh, I think the media has an influence. <clears throat> I, uh, I personally, personally don't uh, have the uh, degree of trust or confidence in what I read and hear that I can say unequivocally that I did 30, 40 years ago. It's been watered down. I'm more skeptical. I'm inclined to want to verify or get another opinion, and uh, at least on, on, on issues of significant significance and consequence. Everyday stuff, uh, 
I don't pay much attention to it anyway. <laughs> but uh, in my business, the national security business, uh, um, what is said and done is of extreme consequence. And uh, uh, I pay a lot of attention to media and checking uh, other sources to uh, verify. But in general, I think it's a, a different world. I, I think the credibility is, is not as um, impeccable as it used to be. I think journalism has taken, uh, and maybe, maybe it's more than journalism, but is not as, um, uh, how should, the level of integrity per se, I think has been changed. And I'm not gonna point fingers at any, any particular organization. Uh, I'm, I'm not researched that. There are other organizations that do research it, but that's my impression, and I do pay attention to it, so I think it's an informed judgment that I have. Well, I think it's clear that we as a society can do better, we as individuals can do better, but very few people can do better than Jack London tonight, so let's give him a round of applause.